Are we set up correctly? I'm asking for the specialist there. All right, all ready to go. So uh, uh, good afternoon and uh, good, good evening. And uh, we may have a few folks in France and, and Europe uh, following this panel. Um, I'm the chair of the American Meteorological Society Committee on uh, applications of, of uh, artificial intelligence to environmental sciences. <clears throat> so we're, our goal is to create events, to develop a community that helps you all um, learn more, uh, communicate, exchange ideas on how to use machine learning to environmental sciences problem. And uh, this afternoon, I'm uh, delighted that uh, my colleague from the committee, uh, Carlos Gaetan, from uh, Vice President, now Vice President, at uh, uh, Arable.com has set uh, has put together a terrific panel. Uh, we will have one representative from a small to medium company, uh, one academic, somebody from a government lab, and somebody from a larger company. And they're going to tell us. Uh, well, I'm going to let Carlos introduce them. For those of you who are following uh, this, um, who are f following this panel remotely, you can ask a question through our committee Twitter account. And uh, we'll have at the end of the uh, at the end of the talks we'll have yeah. the meeting, and it's AMS underscore AIML for artificial intelligence machine learning. Carlos, uh, thank you, Philip. Uh, so let's start the presentation. Uh, so thanks for attending this uh, first panel uh, that we organized on the state of artificial intelligence for environmental science applications. As uh, Philip was mentioning, uh, we're delighted to have. Uh, this great group of uh, panelists, uh, William Shea from the University of British Columbia, Vladimir Krasnopolsky from NOAA, and uh, John Williams uh, from IBM, those are the weather company. Uh, so as uh, Philippe was like highlighting, uh, this also will be an interesting opportunity for you to uh, pique the mind of these uh, great machine learning practitioners uh, that had worked in uh, in academia, mainly the government and the private sector, but also uh, to know more about how they came into this line of work, their past experiences, uh, why they became interested in what we are doing here, and how they are building community from the uh, time where Vladimir uh, was chairing the committee to, to now, where we are like, so delighted to have this, uh, this, uh, this audience. Um, so I will uh, uh, try to moderate some questions, but I like this to be very interactive. Uh, please, uh, I encourage you to go to the microphone and uh, ask them freely about uh, experiences, uh, approaches, uh, uh, suggestions, best techniques, uh, even like uh, be bold. Uh, this is a great opportunity for, for you, for us, uh, also for the panelists to receive uh, feedback from you, like new applications, and uh, for you to, to know what has been done and what they think that is going to be in the future. Um, so I will uh, just uh, uh, probably start with uh, uh, John. Uh, <laughs> uh, Williams uh, gave us uh, some, uh, some uh, of the of his uh, highlights, so I gave him a, a series of questions, uh, like about how he came to the field, uh, main contributions, difficulties, roadblocks, uh, programming languages. Uh, so I just want uh, you to elaborate more if uh, you want on this line of thought. Should I come up? Sure. Uh, Hi everyone, it's a, a real honor to be here today and to share this panel with some real trailblazers in the field. I definitely feel like the, the new kid on the block, um, but uh, I, I hope my perspective will be of interest to you. Um, I first ran into neural networks in, in college and, and wrote a paper on them, and then when I was in grad school I had the opportunity, even though I was studying mathematics, to take some classes in computer science and, and learned about reinforcement learning and, and ended up working on a dissertation that proved some convergence properties of a class of policy iteration algorithms. So reinforcement learning is about uh, discovering through interaction with the environment how to, how to plan, how to, to behave optimally uh, based on the feedback. 
Uh, and, and so that was a, an, a mathematical exercise, but also a very, uh, an introduction to a very relevant field of sort of optimal through machine learning. Uh, I, I then went to the National Center for Atmospheric Research, where I was for 18 years, and was introduced to fuzzy logic. Uh, fuzzy logic is an expert system methodology for trying to sort of mimic how human experts solve problems. So it's not a machine learning technique, uh, it's an expert s system technique, and it was used very fruitfully at NCAR for re recognizing features in images and doing quality control for data uh, and, and a whole host of applications. Um, I then moved into to using random forests uh, for a couple of problems in the interface of um, short-term modeling and, uh, and data fusion of observations for uh, particularly um, forecasting convectively induced turbulence. There wasn't really good theory about where turbulence should appear around thunderstorms in, in 3D. So one approach to that was to apply machine learning with aircraft observations we had of turbulence and observations that we had of thunderstorms and then from dynamical models, the thunderstorm environment. And, uh, as, and, and so that, that, was, that was very interesting and, and fruitful work. And then also now casting convection. And, and there, perhaps the physics is better understood, but we have a gap between sort of when a dynamical model can run and actually output its forecast. And during that gap, a lot of evolution has happened uh, of the storm and the storm environment. And the, the question is how to merge those together to figure out whether there's going to be a, a, a convective storm affecting aviation in the 15, 30 minute out to two hour time frame. And, and then finally, uh, at the, near the end of my, t my time at NCAR, I used uh, a decision tree model called Cubist uh, for doing uh, electric load forecasting for Excel Energy. Um, and Sue helped in the front row led that project. That was also very, very interesting work. Sort of outside the domain of, of forecasting per se, but now taking the forecasts and applying them to an impact and allowing a company, in this case Excel Energy, to optimize um, their, their energy uh, purchases and, and deployment of their, their energy assets. I think my contribution through all of this has been uh, less the development of, of new techniques and more the reduction to practice of existing techniques. And some of the things that I focused on, and we were talking earlier today about the black box versus white box problem, but with random forests, using variable importance to try to get an insight into what the model was keying off of, what, what variables were important. Uh, the, the key idea being if you, if you have a, a variable, an input variable, and you want to know how important it is, permute its values within the test set and then run it back through um, and, and see how well the model does then. And if the model performance degrades a lot, then that variable is important. So, so that was a way of, of kind of finding out what the model is doing. And then also spent a lot of time on feature selection. Uh, a model is only as good as the data that you can put into it. And using our physical intuitions to guide the selection of those features, uh, I, I believe is very important. I, I think it'll, it'll be a long time until you can just throw a machine learning model at a problem and do as well as someone who's kind of thoughtfully uh, worked through what the features are from the weather or the weather patterns that can help the computer uh, discriminate or, or uh, make a forecast. Um, uh, probabilistic uh, calibration is, uh, is something that I did in terms of um, probabilistic forecasts of turbulence and convection, and then also evaluation. And I think everyone knows about uh, cross-validation, but I think one thing we may not appreciate is the importance of choosing training and test sets out of truly independent sets. So you can't choose them out of, out of adjacent incidents or even adjacent hours, really trying to separate the training testing sets in time so that you were sure that your model was keying on, on the right physical relationships. Some difficulties and roadblocks uh, faced. Computational resources were a problem. Uh, I developed a, I and a, t and a team at NCAR developed a NEXRAD turbulence detection algorithm, which uh, since 2008 has been making uh, real-time three-dimensional maps of in-cloud turbulence over the CONUS, running on a, a server there, 
that's, that data still is not available to the public in any form. And, and part of the problem has been the computational resources, bandwidth, and, and computation required to run it. Some of that has been interagency coordination, honestly, between the FAA uh, and, and NOAA and, and NCAR as part of that as well. Um, funding, I think, is always a problem for, for doing work on the cutting edge and sort of inconsistent consistencies in those funding streams make it difficult to really gain momentum uh, and, and develop a sequential uh, set of, of solutions to related problems. Uh, programming languages, I've been a MATLAB user for a long time and you can, you can do many things in MATLAB uh, and to some extent uh, C++ and Python. Oops, going the wrong way. <laughs> going even further the wrong way. All right, so some thoughts on present developments. Deep learning, I have to admit that I haven't used deep learning. We've talked a little bit about how we might use it. Um, and I, I work for IBM, so IBM has Watson, which has a lot of deep learning capabilities. Uh, I, I find it intriguing. I found some of the talks here to be interesting. I think transfer learning is, is a really important idea and not just in learning how to recognize one kind of images when trained on another kind of images, but learning on how to take optimal actions in one set of problems when you've learned about another uh, independent set of, of problems, so in the re reinforcement learning framework. Um, and then I already made the point that I, I think even with deep learning, as magical as it is, it's important to have uh, a subject matter expertise uh, in order to use it in a meaningful way or in an optimal way. Uh, Carlos asked, uh, what's the impact of Amazon Web Services, IBM Watson, and Google Cloud? I think one of the things it's done is really democratized AI. Yeah, anyone can go get an account uh, and start playing with some of these tools, fairly easily scale it up. Uh, it's, a, it's basically a matter of can you, <laughs> putting on my, my private industry hat, can you get enough revenue for this cool thing that you've developed to pay for the resources that you're, you're using and your time and make a profit out of that? There's, but a lot of the barriers to actually getting going, uh, I, I think, are not as, as high as they once were. I, I mentioned it's also easy to make a mess. I, you know, I think a lot of these tools, you take them out of the box and you start playing with them and uh, sometimes things j don't work well and you don't understand why. Uh, that's, that's part of the problem with having a powerful toolbox is, is you still do need to have the, the physical intuition, the knowledge of how it's working under the, the hood to really be able to use it well. Um, co-locating curated data at the same place where you have the compute, I think is going to be a huge enabler uh, for our science. And you know, I've been, I know there have been, there have been some talks about this, including at our, our uh, committee lunch uh, just now. How can we get these curated data sets that will allow us to compare methodologies and um, make progress as a community? Uh, at, at IBM, we have the IBM Cloud. The weather company provides data to IBM Cloud via an API. So we're, we're trying to chip away at this, but I, I think there's a lot of work uh, still, still to be done here. So what am I working on? Uh, three years ago, I went from NCAR to the weather company, and I worked on uh, several things, just to highlight a couple of them. Uh, global on-demand consensus forecasts. Um, we had a system developed uh, jointly by INCAR and the weather company many years ago called DieCast, which takes a number of dynamical models and using observations both corrects the models for sy systematic errors and chooses optimal weights for combining them. And so this, the system that we run at the weather company uh, allows you to make a query at any point in the world and get a forecast out 15 days for 17 weather variables. So uh, one thing that I did is it, it was using a stochastic gradient descent technique. I changed it to using a regression technique in which we actually keep a database of the, um, the forecast values and the observations and we retune the model every time we get a new observation. And we rerun the model every time we get a request. So if you, if you make a request to our system, we'll use the latest observations have gone into tuning, tuning the model that we use, and then we'll make the freshest forecast at that time using all the different uh, um, dynamical model forecasts that are available. Um, one, of this th one of the things this switch did is allowed us not to have to worry so much 
about bad data getting in. If, you, if you're doing stochastic gradient descent and you get a bad observation that comes in, you've, you've messed up your, your weights or biases and you don't have a good way to recover because you didn't save that observation. But if you're saving a database and re retraining every time you get a new observation, you can quality control your observations, update your observations, and then you have an, a, a new model immediately. The other thing it allowed us to do is that if we don't have uh, input for all, from all the dynamical models, it allows us to optimize for the dynamical models that we do have. So I, I think this is a theme of how do you handle, in the real world, it's a theme that, that comes out again and again, how do you handle missing and bad data? Uh, that, because you, ha you have to make a forecast, um, and, and so you have to figure out a way to do it. So the other thing I've been working on uh, more recently, a, a year ago we spun out our first set of probabilistic forecasts, and by that I mean you can go to any point in the world and ask for a probability distribution function of, uh, I think we're up to seven different variables. And out, out to 10 days, you can get a PDF at each hour, out to 10 days. Um, you can also aggregate over different periods of time, get maximum minimums or sums of different variables, and get PDFs from, from those. So there have been a number of very interesting problems to work out with that. We think that this capability is critical for um, um, evaluating risks and making optimal decisions in a number of our, the industry uh, sectors that we support as well as in the consumer sector. If you want to figure out uh, whether to plan an outside event, you want to know not just what the mean forecast is, but what the chance is of that extreme uh, event. So uh, let's see, big data and, and ML, data quali quality control, I think is a cornerstone of, of real life applications. At the weather company, we use humans to help. We have humans sitting and watching the radar images, and when our automatic quality control doesn't, doesn't uh, catch something, the humans do. So there's a real, real opportunity for, for humans and machines to interact. And then um, another thing is we make 26 billion forecasts a day. We're handling a lot of data throughput, and they're, they're, there's auto scaling in our, our systems to, to handle increased demand, a lot of those problems. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention is also the human in the loop. We have a system which makes the forecasts automatically, but humans are watching them, and if they feel that the temperature just needed to be nudged down here or the precipitation needs to be up here, they're meteorologists. There are ways for them to put filters on top of that forecast, but the data keeps flowing through, and that human input is, is added before it goes out the door. So public-private partnerships, I just wanted to say the government, INSEP, um, and, and other governments around the world are absolutely key partners in what we do. We could not do what we do without them. We are advocates for them absolutely. New satellite systems, new observing systems, new models. It's all critical. Um, the private sector, I think, has a role in providing uh, personalization, communication, working with industry uh, verticals, and, and doing decision support products. And I think that decision support is an area that our a community um, <coughs> probably can start being more and more involved in, especially given the tools and the needs. Uh, academia can partner uh, with industry. Uh, we, we do. The weather company, IBM, uh, does uh, uh, provide funding to academic institutions and to, to NCAR and others to work on a project and then take, take the results of that work and implement it into our, our products. There's a big software engineering process that us ne usually needs to happen there, and it, it's difficult, and sometimes there's also an intellectual property issue. Um, so, so those can be things that get in the way. Um, role of scientists under increasing automation. I've, I've mentioned that um, humans can have a role in, in quality control of, of both, both data and forecasts. Um, and I think they also have important value in, in interpretation. Until we make Watson a little bit better, people are not going to call up Watson and ask them, you know, whether they should uh, buy or sell their energy futures and things like that. We, we still have uh, human beings helping with those kinds of decisions. So suggestions for new practitioners, and there's a lot I can say here, but um, what, one of the key things that my, my hat at private, private industry has, has sort of changed in my way of thinking is cost benefit is absolutely key. If you have a new method that outperforms just a little bit more, but it uses more memory or more compute, I have to, I have to analyze whether the additional benefit that that algorithm is producing 
is worth the, act the added complexity, cost of maintenance, and the amount that I'm paying for the, for the machines that I'm using and the compute I'm using. And simple methods often work really well. Um, and so 80-20 rule, right? If you can get 80% of the way to the optimal solution with 20% of the effort in private industry, that's usually or often the way to go. I, I think that this can, can perhaps inform a little bit the way the academic community works too. So the, the best papers, I think, compare new methods not to sort of an existing untuned model uh, or to climatology, but to a real legitimate contender. Uh, if you're comparing against an existing forecasting system, do bias correction on that forecasting system using the same data set. It's only fair, right? And so when I'm looking for the optimal solution, I'm, I'm asking really hard questions about whether the, the added value uh, is made up for, um, the added value is worth the added cost. So let's see, and uh, develop performance metrics related to the end user applications to the extent that you can. Use a lot of, it's good to use a lot of performance metrics. Uh, don't ignore quality control, uh, provide the right data and uh, subject matter expertise. And I just wanted to, to mention two anecdotes uh, for subject matter expertise. One is when I was working to now cast convection and using satellite data, I had all the brightness uh, temperatures going in and I, I trained my random forest and it did okay. But when I took the difference of the long wave IR and the vapor channel, the, the water vapor channel, it did better. I mean, that, that raised the importance values of both of those parameters. By just understanding physically that, that that difference meant something and it would make the information more accessible to the model, it, it, was, it was really useful. So there's a, there's a place for physical understanding in, um, in, in training these models. The other example that I wanted to make in terms of, of cost benefit is in looking at these, um, the, the forecasting models, uh, if you start with the, the best model in the world uh, and bias correct it, we found for temperature that you get about a 15% improvement just from bias correcting it. If you then take that model and you average it, um, just equal weights average with all the other models, you get about another 10% improvement. Now if, if you use uh, inverse variance weights, so where you weight the models inversely to their error variance, you get another 3%. If you use stochastic gradient descent, you get another 3%. If you do all the fancy things that we can think about, you get another 3%. For us, that last 3% is worth it because Bill Myers is in the audience. We, we compete for, for performance, and that's important, those headline values. So it's worth it to us. But boy, we could get a lot of the way toward that ideal forecast with, with really a much simpler approach. So I've, I've talked long enough. Um, thank you. I'll turn it back over to Carlos. Thank you, John. Very refreshing. <laughs> so uh, now to continue with uh, this uh, line of questioning, I want to ask uh, Vladimir uh, <laughs> and William uh, your historical perspective, like how you entered the field. Uh, what was your first? Uh, uh, feel free to use your microphones or come here. As, uh, it's better suit you. You before me. So. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, I started working uh, with uh, neural nets uh, in the middle of 90s. Uh, that time I worked on prediction of geophysical time series like uh, Southern Oscillation Index and similar. And uh, working uh, on this task and uh, learning more and more about neural nets, I recognized very quickly that it's a unique tool for approximation multidimensional mapping. Mapping is a relationship between two vectors, two sets of parameters, and tremendous amount of very practical, important applications can be considered as mappings and solved with neural net. So then I started moving in different directions. First, I uh, moved in uh, satellite data and uh, in inverse and forward problem 
uh, with satellite data, we developed a couple of retrieval algorithms and forward model for direct assimilation. Uh, then uh, understanding came that inside numerical models, physical parameterizations, they are mapping, mappings, and you can uh, simulate them, emulate them, or develop new parameterizations using neural nets. So we developed fast, uh, long wave and short wave radiation for NCAR model and for our NCEP uh, climate prediction model and uh, global weather prediction model. And then <laughs> different applications started coming from <laughs> all directions because, as I said, uh, mappings is a uh, very universal mathematical um, object uh, and tremendous amount of applications can be considered. For example, we emulated, in collaboration with the University of Maryland, we emulated cloud resolving model inside multi-scale uh, modeling framework uh, with neural net. Uh, currently, I'm working on uh, um, averaging, nonlinear averaging of ensembles using neural net, on uh, gap filling in satellite data, again using neural nets, uh, on uh, developing a biological model for ocean color. So uh, <laughs> there are so many applications that I, I don't have time to change the tool. <laughs> I still working with a neural net. So, uh, and do we have the slides which here? here yes, and I, I would like to, to show you one or two slides. Great timing, Vladimir. Here are your slides. All yours. <laughs> Actually, from the beginning of uh, this AI history, there are a lot of talks and speculations about human and artificial intelligence, how smart co could be computers, and it continues on and on till now. You know, recently, uh, Elon Musk, uh, Bill Gates, and even Stephen Hawking uh, said something about it. Uh, unfortunately, it's uh, uh, most of this um, talking is uh, our speculations because there are very few, especially in our field, sp very few cases when really human performance and, for example, neural network performance could be directly compared. And in my practice, I I had one of applications where we had a chance to compare human performance and uh, neural network performance. So, of course, it's a simple applica application. It doesn't say anything. Uh, it doesn't ask, answer question, can computer think or <laughs> whatever. But it tells something about uh, capabilities of AI in uh, simple but practical applications. Uh, what I'm talking about is uh, averaging of multimodal ensemble for precipitation. Uh, we have uh, a TENSEP available uh, outputs of eight models from different parts of the world, from two our NSEP models, uh, European model, European Meteorological Center, uh, UK MO model, uh, German, French, uh, Japanese, and yes, somebody else. Uh, oh, Canadian, Canadian. So, and uh, we built multimodal ensemble uh, from these eight models for precipitation. And uh, standard way of uh, getting information from this ensemble is calculate average, and usually uh, what people calculate is conservative mean, conservative ensemble, so-called. It's simple statistical mean. 
so. But in this case, for example, uh, uh, what this picture shows, upper left panel shows uh, observations of ground truth in our, in our case. It's uh, uh, analysis which is produced on, uh, in com Climate Prediction Center on model grid. And uh, we use it for uh, training and for validation for our neural network. This panel, upper right, shows uh, this um, conservative ensemble, simple mean. And you immediately could see uh, that uh, drawbacks, problems which uh, such simple mean has. Uh, it diminishes maximums. It diffuses features, uh, smoother fronts, and moreover, it produces huge areas of false low-level precipitation. This is because simple shift in different models, these areas are low-level precipitation are shifted, and when you average, you produce huge fields of false precipitation. Uh, lower left shows what neural network does neural network which is trained on this data. So it has uh, eight ensemble members uh, from different models, uh, precipitation fields as input, and uh, it has also its one, uh, how to say it, one, one grid point neural net that takes information from one grid point and produces uh, average for the same grid point. And then you move it along entire grid or entire uh, US. Uh, this is why it has additional inputs. Let long, it has uh, time of the day and uh, day of the year to pick up the urinal and <coughs> annual cycle. So, and this is a job which neural network does. Of course, it's significantly better than uh, this ensemble. It enhances again back returns uh, maximums, it sharpens fronts, and it reduces very significantly this false low-level uh, precipitation fields. But how, as I said, in this case, we had very nice and very fortunate opportunity to compare uh, our neural network prediction with human prediction in hydrological uh, center. Uh, human forecaster produces the same forecast for precipitation. And uh, I would like to say to emphasize that uh, in, in, in addition to model fields which are available for neural net, a human forecaster uses a lot of additional information. Uh, satellite images, uh, radar images, so and some other sources of information. So and you can see that predictions are very similar. Predictions which pr are produced for by neural net are very similar. It's not worse than human prediction. And I would say that in some areas, for example, here and here, it's even better. Uh, neural network recognizes a uh, fine structure which human being cannot recognize. So uh, I would like, I wanted to show you this image to, uh, these images to uh, clarify a little bit, to show you real example, real comparison between uh, neural network and human performance. And for such important but rather simple cases, uh, you can see that neural network can uh, work as well, at least, or uh, sometimes even or before um, human beings. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Vladimir. Thank you. It's uh, great to have like that uh, slide showing like the comparison of neural nets versus human performance. Uh, William, uh, oh, could you please, please uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, talk about your oh, how I get started in. Um, uh, neural network. Uh, my background training was in physics and math undergraduate. My master's in nuclear physics and my PhD was in physical oceanography. So I don't know any, I didn't know any statistics or machine learning, anything like that. 
1992, 93, I ran to this young scientist, uh, Bang Yang Tang. So he told me about his neural networks. Because you remember, the, they became popular in 1986, right? So I looked at it, and I said, oh, yeah, that looks very interesting. I had not heard of anybody doing anything on this. So uh, we wrote a proposal, I wrote a proposal, and uh, it wasn't funded. Uh, this 93 cent in a proposal wasn't, get, wasn't funded. I think it's too weird. So I tried again in 95, and I got funded, right? So I started working with Bang Tang on um, using neural networks to predict um, El Ninos. And uh, so it went from there. But I had some problem explaining to my colleagues why I switched fields, because in 95, I was uh, 40 years old. So my friends all thought I had a midlife, midlife crisis. Right? I suddenly <laughs> gone crazy and gone into this AI nonsense. Right? <laughs> so I'm, I, so I, I ran to them in the conference, and they, uh, they asked me what I'm doing. I said, well, I'm doing this artificial intelligence stuff, and they said, oh, oh, very interesting, very interesting. Oh, well, nice talking to you, and <laughs> ran off to talk to somebody else, right? <laughs> so I was very lonely for a while, and I go to concerts, and nobody knew what I was doing. I was lucky to go to AMS, and I found no, um, a small group of people, Vladimir, Karen, and Sue, are kind of interested in all this area, and so I think we, we've been pretty consistent, because at that time, we were really isolated, because uh, we don't come to here and we go to other conferences, people just sort of, ah, these weird people, you know, they don't want to talk with us. Right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I've been uh, to AMS very often. And, um, and also, you know, when you change fields like that, uh, the early days getting graduate students was a problem too, right? Because they come in, they're good students, they have a lot of other professors, and they come to me and say, do you do global warming, right? So I said, no, not really. <laughs> and then I tried to put on my best salesmanship, right? So I said, um, well, why do you want to do global warming? You know, every scientist and his brother-in-law is interested in global warming. Right? <laughs> so I said, this is like uh, joining the army, right? But if you go to uh, artificial intelligence, it's like going to a virgin island, unexplored, you know, you're all by yourself. You should be doing that, right? Uh, of course, uh, uh, a few weeks later, I get an email from the students saying, after careful consideration, I decided to do my PhD in global warming. <laughs> How was that? <laughs> Uh, yeah. You convinced me to do global warming and AI, so. Yeah, but, but by, by then, by his time, I think that the, the tide has changed a little bit, you know? AI is starting to get a lot of attraction, um, uh, attention by, by then, so. Yeah, thank you, William. And uh, you want to elaborate, like, for example, your nonlinear principal components? Uh, um, uh, yeah, I could, but, but a lot of data sets are so messy. It's yeah. not, not, you know, again, it's one of these methods trying to mm -hmm. extract a uh, clean signal, sort of make it more interpretable. And I find that uh, much of machine learning is not very fruitful to try to extract, you know, clean explanation kind of uh, approach. Um, I mean, you could try it, you know, all, all these, because uh, non principal component analysis is a little bit on the, the white side instead of black box, you know, <laughs> a little bit on the, um, yeah, you could try it, but not, I, I'm not totally successful, because a lot of modes you cannot extract very cleanly, right? I think that's the problem. Um, yeah, I, I think the, uh, the thing I like is all these randomized neural networks, very interesting, you know, very fast. And, and now, of course, I'm interested in all these extremes. You know, what, what happened to you? What will happen when you apply machine learning to extremes? I think, I think it's totally straightforward. Thank you, William. So uh, what about, uh, like, if we use all this fantastic information and uh, uh, the information that you gave in your keynote, uh, presentation earlier and the contributions of, of John and Vladimir, and we open the floor for uh, for questions and just uh, dedicate the last 20 minutes of this session to pick their minds and answer questions from Twitter. If we have some, uh, yes, please. Uh, I encourage you to use the mic, please. Um, so I have a question to Dr. Um, John Williams. Um, so our group is. Uh, working in um, reinforcement learning um, in some applications, and we just start um, going to climatologies. So yesterday I have a presentation about uh, designing an optimal um, control using based on reinforcement learning to uh, control the temperatures of a planet for a simplified model. It's still a pre preliminary work. Um, so uh, my question is based because you have some experience with uh, working with reinforcement learning in the past. What is the potential? Uh, of using reinforcement learning in um, um, decision making process in climatologies, and maybe some difficulty with that. John, want to use that microphone? 
So I did see your talk, and I, I think it was a, a very interesting talk. Um, I'm not sure if I can answer exactly the question you're, you're asking, because I'm not really uh, so conversant with um, you know, the, the particular application that, that you used. Um, reinforcement learning does give us a way to optimize actions given an uncertain um, or, or stochastic representation of how things can evolve. And so th there certainly is, I think, relevance to that to a lot of decisions that society is making. If we have different ways the climate can evolve and we understand how the decisions that we're making um, impact that, we can, we can look at the cost. We can look at the cost of having the environment lot, not how we want it to be and how much it would cost to make the environment, uh, you, to, to uh, do things to mitigate carbon dioxide or recapture or whatever. Uh, and, and I thought that was a very impl interesting implication, uh, uh, illustration of the use of reinforcement learning. I'm not sure I can give you more specific advice. Maybe some others in the audience, I know Amy McGovern has some experience with reinforcement learning, so maybe there are, there are others who would have some, some thoughts for you. Amy, you want to <laughs> give your five cents? <laughs> or <laughs> I get five cents? <laughs> I, th I think I'm having trouble with the application of reinforcement learning, too, because I saw your talk, but it's interesting theoretically, but how do we actually use it to control? Because that's what reinforcement, I mean, all my, <laughs> I do have experience in reinforcement learning, that's what my PhD's in, but it's on doing robots, where the robots actually can control things, and we don't <laughs> really have good control over the things system. that we're controlling with the, what they're simulating with the reinforcement learning, so I'm still thinking hard about the applications there. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Other thoughts in the room? Or questions? Another question there. All right, thank you all. Uh, my question is mainly for, for John, and but the other panelists can obviously comment uh, if you have something to say. So my question is about the, the transferring uh, machine learning models developed into, in the lab into operations. So what ma makes machine learning really great is you could build really powerful models relatively quickly uh, in a laboratory environment. but when you transfer them into operations, you, you end up running into problems. Uh, one of the, you, you mentioned bad data and missing data, but also I would say changing data. Sensors get better, models get better. So at the weather company or in other applications you've worked in, uh, how do you account for something like that? So as I mentioned, one of the ways that we work at that is we constantly retrain our models. Every time a new observation arrives, we retrain the models. Now that's not going to be possible with a, a deep learning uh, model, uh, obviously. So, um, but, it, but it's an issue. So can you take a deep learning model and then, and then train a delta on top of that um, dynamically to, to keep up with some of the short-term changes? You know, so can, can you integrate it in? So it's, it's a preprocessor of the information, but then you also have a linear regression, you know, uh, that, that's, uh, that's tracking any, any changes or increasing bias in your model. That, that's just off the my, top of my head. My guess is that you've thought more about this problem uh, and that you, that you might have some ideas too. How, how are you dealing so, with this? So yeah, so the solutions that we use are, aren't that much more sophisticated than what you just said. Taking the model we've trained off the data we have, maybe updating our data set. If it's a type of model you can retrain pretty frequently, you know, maybe it takes over in May. So maybe you can train it, you know, once a day, once a week sort of thing, and, you know, but you're just updating your data set. But that, that takes a lot of maintenance because you've got to make sure that you're collecting, the, collecting all the data that you're processing and sometimes storage is an issue and other things like that. So, you, uh, you, you sort of, so what we're trying to find, and this is the reason for my question, is a more efficient way of, of you know, sort of doing this online learning with these deep, deep uh, models. So if anyone has anything to say, so David, I'll pass it to you. Uh, one idea that comes to mind from seeing a lot of the work in, with transfer learning where basically people take the, like in uh, Amy's talk earlier this morning with the, the uh, predict, uh, identifying bir birds and radar, uh, you can, if, you have, if you're able to train a model that, uh, like a convolutional neural net and, to, and have some pretty robust convolutional features, um, 
uh, in those layers, then, then you can hold those relatively constant and just update the, the regression portion as you get new data in. Because the, the, the end is essentially a, a bunch of convolutional neural nets and then, or convolution layers, and then it's usually either a regular neural net or even something as simple as a logistic regression on the end, and that's really easy to update. So you, so you may just want to update the convolutions every once in a while, but then, but, but then only update the end a lot more often. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Brian. I have sort of a, I have a question and kind of like a cautionary tale slash anecdote to segue into it just to sort of motivate the question. So um, for the talk I gave yesterday, which was on uh, using machine learning to forecast severe thunderstorm winds, um, I didn't talk about the machine learning very much, but I ran a whole bunch of experiments with 1,800 different model configurations, and they were for the most part complex, fairly complex models. They were random forests and gradient boosted trees and uh, feed forward neural nets. And I found that after doing all that, experimenting with 1,800 different model configurations and finding the best one in the validation data, I tried another thing where I just did EOF analysis and took the top, uh, the principal components that explained the top 80 or 90 percent of the variance and ran that through logistic regression and got similar to even better results with a much simpler model after a little bit of data pre-processing. And I'm just wondering if y'all find that, um, that people still do things like that these days, or do you find that a lot of people jump immediately towards using complex models without trying these simpler solutions. Uh, William, want to address that question? Um, <laughs> yeah, I think people would sometimes they jump into models maybe too difficult and too complex. Um, you know, I, I know people all jump into deep learning, but um, you know, I think for a lot of problems, you know, shallow neural networks probably do as well as deep neural networks. Um, you know, the only difference if you have a lot of data, then I think deep neural networks will, will, will help you, right? So um, similarly, you know, a lot of problems that people mentioned, like if you solve a problem using linear regression, you use neural network, neural network doesn't seem to beat linear regression that much, right? Uh, so yeah, I, I don't know. I think you have to be careful not just jump in the most powerful uh, weapon you can get hold of, mm -hmm. kind of thing, yeah. I'm gonna give a, I have the mic so I can give you a follow-up question on that. So deep learning, fantastic results when it comes to imagery. Uh, are there other segments of the environmental sciences, uh, other type of data sets outside of imagery where it, uh, you all see uh, a good potential for deep learning? I think if you have a huge amount of data, prob probably, but, but you know, in environmental sciences, we don't always have that much data, right? You know, maybe spatially we have a lot, but temporally we, we might not have that much. No. So it, yeah, so that's the, that's the challenge for our environmental sciences. Yeah. It's creating the data set that allows us to take yeah. advantage of deep learning. Yeah. Is, that, is that a fair statement? Yeah. Or, yeah. Well, anyway, go ahead. Maybe. I'm going to agree with that. I was going to actually make a follow-on question to Ryan's, because Ryan has a good mm -hmm. point. And uh, I'll throw this one at you. You know, the room has been full, and that's great. And suddenly AI has grown in popularity, and we're having all these discussions at the committee meetings. There are a lot of people who want to throw the AI toolkit as an answer without understanding things. So how do you think that we encourage the more physical understanding? Um, in particular, I once had a paper re relatively recently rejected because I didn't cite somebody else whose paper had no physical understanding and it was a really bad paper. And, and it was just, well, these other people have done this and so therefore they've covered it. They were predicting temperature. And, and we were doing something on tornadoes. They're completely separate, but they don't understand that they're different. And I don't know how we convince people outside the meteorology community to, I, I don't yeah. just want tools. That's, I guess th that's the question. Thoughts on how we make this work as we grow, growing pains. None of you wants to answer Lighting that, here. huh? John. <laughs> So I'll jump in and say, I think there might be room for uh, a, a paper on best practices. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what that would look like, but that might give some guidelines to reviewers and others who are not sure how to re review papers that are at the intersection of an application domain and artificial intelligence. And I guess another thing to say is, obviously, when you're when you're going into an AI journal, that's a much harder, was this an AI journal or a, yeah, a, yeah so that's. But somebody's already done it, so therefore it's not interesting. They did temperatures, the tornadoes aren't interesting. Right, so, <laughs> so I, think, I think one of the, one of the, and Amy, this won't be a surprise to you, but one of the structural problems with uh, machine learning AI uh, as, as a discipline is that it's highly focused on new techniques 
and not reduction to, to practice of, you know, of those techniques. And where the rubber meets, meets the road, you know, especially from where I'm sitting now, is in the reduction to practice. Before the next question, I'm going to make a, a couple of comments. One is that AMS is looking uh, for best practices. So if there's a group in this room, in the AI, who wants to think through, I, w I told them that it was changing too fast, that it was not for us, but maybe the time has come. Mm -hmm. Now there's a lot of, uh, several folks in this room have asked for a, for, for a workshop on how to get started, and the community is thinking about it. We wanted to get those, and go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm relatively new to environmental sciences pro uh, problems, and I've been talking to quite a few people over here. And one of the things that uh, you know most talks have a title on, or at least in, you know part of the future work, is deep learning. And I have a problem with very few training samples and a large number of features, and it doesn't necessarily lend it, deep learning doesn't necessarily lend itself to such problems. So I was just wondering. Um, uh, and this is not just to the panel, but you know to everyone over here, um, if we could have um, a discussion, and this is going back to the two questions, uh, um, you know, I, I don't know his name, the gentleman in the blue shirt uh, asked uh, as well, yeah, about like going back to, I mean, um, considering um, other machine learning um, uh, algorithms, techniques, whatever, um, to certain problems that, you know, might be very, so the additional problem I have is that there's not sufficient domain knowledge for what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to model ice storms and uh, it's been very challenging. So, um, so, this confluence of where your data is such that you can't apply something that's cutting edge in machine learning necessarily, but and you know with um, not much physical um, understanding as well of you know the actual processes that go into that. Um, I'd be interested to know if um, you have any thoughts on how to kind of like network with other people or even like get started on working on. I mean, you know. Uh, kind of uh, push through with these problems. So I am giving a talk tomorrow, and I'm happy to talk to you know anyone who can, who has suggestions uh, on this. So, um, so I guess this is more of an open-ended like, yeah. can I talk to you kind of thing <laughs> rather than a question. But yeah, I'd be willing to hear thoughts from anyone. Uh, so if it's if it's okay for her to talk to you, please raise your hand. I want to talk to Rongini? <laughs> All right, she's great. We are. Uh, Great community. <laughs> so, so I guess you know you're doing the right thing and standing up and talking to to network. So, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, w one way to approach, and maybe not the best way to approach a problem where you don't have very much training data, is to use expert system approaches, where you you ask how would a human being solve this problem, and fuzzy logic is one of the ways of getting at that. And then you, you can tune tune a fuzzy logic algorithm with the data that you have, but you've imposed a structure on your solution that means that you may not require as much data to get a good solution. Uh, Vladimir, for example, uh, you want to address uh, uh, how the parameters of the web models probably could be like, improved uh, using uh, machine learning methods, but how also you use your domain knowledge to say, like, for example, this parameter doesn't make sense when the albedo just like goes to 0 0.999. Like, you know, it's possible, but that could cause like a, a whole uh, trouble when you are calibrating weather models or like climate models. So, how was your approach, or like, and your reception when working on a, on a government lab uh, while dealing with new techniques to do parametrizations? Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. It's a very interesting question, actually. Uh, when you have a real model, a uh, high resolution model, uh, then in this case, parameterization is a mapping uh, which has uh, many hundreds of inputs and many hundreds of outputs. And as you well know, it means uh, that domain for this mapping has dimensionality of many hundreds. And to fill such a domain with uh, data, you need uh, astronomical amount of uh, data, two to the power of many hundreds. It's absolutely non-real to do such work. and. Uh, when we first approached this uh, task, uh, we stopped in 
I don't know, uh, we were scared how to do it. But then uh, we recognized that actually uh, physical domain is a very small subdomain of this huge domain of many hundreds, uh, of dimensionality many hundreds. It's a very small in volume and it's uh, much less dimensional than uh, the cube, hypercube. So, uh, but how to pick up this domain? Actually, in the model, equations which are uh, embedded in the model, they automatically pick up this domain. How can you pick up it without the model? You cannot, period. So this is why the only way to do such uh, work, for example, to emulate parameterization or uh, cloud resolving model inside another model, it's a simulate training set using the model, which automatically puts your inputs and outputs inside physical domain and uh, the size of this domain is tremendously less than theoretical two to the power something, which is called actually curse of dimensionality. So I don't know if I answered. Uh, Fantastic, yeah, thank you very much, Vladimir. I think uh, that's very refreshing and gives a uh, uh, good overview of like how to approach the, those kind of problems where theoretically you have like a bigger domain space to to try to sample, but once you have like the expert knowledge, you can just reduce your problem. So we have uh, room for two more questions, uh, uh, please. All right, so speaking as a student, I see a fair number of students around me. Um, and all three of you expressed different but very strong mathematical backgrounds. So I have a twofold question. One, what mathematical fields and what, what parts of math are very, very important to understand to get the basis, the basics of all of this? And the second is, if we want to make expert contributions to things, where do we need to head? Right? What, what fields do we need? Do we need analysis? Do we need linear algebra, topology, things of that nature? Thank you. My advisor once told me, you can never know too much linear algebra. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and uh, simple calculus, you know, uh, to know deeply, to go deeper in uh, advanced topics and calculus is important. Of course, functional analysis would be very helpful to learn. Yeah, I, I th think matrices and, you know, is very important because I have students who have trouble, you know, you have a matrix equation and they can't really get the feel what it is or, you know, you have to really see a matrix at itself rather than have to look at individual elements kind of. So, so you, yeah, a good course in yeah. matrix it's algebra is, is very important, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dimension reduction. <laughs> Hi, so it's come up a couple of times in discussion that there's been a lot of uh, movement recently in the community about applying existing techniques from machine learning to atmospheric science. And you've also mentioned that these have some limitations in this domain, such as the extremes that you talked about, so something that's not, it just doesn't quite capture well at the moment. So my question is, I was wondering, are there any other sort of theoretical limitations or theoretical problems that haven't been resolved yet in your mind in atmospheric science for applying machine learning techniques? <laughs> That's a hard one. That's a hard one. So I'll, I'll give it one example. Um, Recently, uh, Google DeepMind trained a, a neural network through self-play, th this, this came up before, uh, trained a, a system, this is reinforcement learning, through self-play to play chess. Uh, you know, they, they did uh, go a, a year ago or whatever, but, but this time to play chess, th solely through self-play. And one of the things that they saw is that the system was able to recover all the known sort of opening moves, right? So it recovered that human knowledge. I think it'd be very interesting to think about uh, techniques in a program in which we can use artificial intelligence to recover physical concepts, physical reasoning. And, and that's sort of the holy, holy grail, uh, one of the holy grails, uh, at, at least, I think, that's still in the field. 
Go for it, Vladimir. Vladimir, <laughs> William. Uh, on this one, both of you need to answer. Yeah. Well, maybe I answer a somewhat different question raised earlier. You know, as a new person, you have lots of methods presented to you, which one to use. Uh, I find that actually very difficult because a lot of these papers you read about new methods, they're actually very misleading mm -hmm. because there's a big bias in publication. You know, to get your paper published, you have to say, my method is better than the standard method. And when you read carefully, the standard method is usually something like neural networks. Yeah. But it's very badly tuned. Uh, it, it doesn't recognize properly a single neural network. I mean, nobody uses a single neural network, always an ensemble, mm -hmm. but sometimes they just use a single neural network. Yeah. Ah, I beat neural networks, so yeah. I can publish. And the reviewers <laughs> never caught this, right? So you have lots of kinds of papers that claim to be better than standard methods are actually nonsense. You have to try them, they don't work. So, so this is a problem. Uh, I think a lot of students would uh, spend a lot of time trying the latest new method, but actually they don't work out. Yeah. Thank you. So probably I can also give one example uh, which comes in mind. Uh, uh, there are a lot of work and uh, labor invested in development numerical models with uh, uh, resolution uh, easily adjusted. So, and uh, there is uh, one problem here because different resolution involves different physical processes. So you need different physics for different resolution, different parameterizations. And I think uh, neural net or another or other tools, AI tools, could be very helpful here to develop smart adjustable physics which would automatically adjust to uh, resolution to, to turn on include proper processes corresponding to resolution which you use in the model. Thank you. Philippe, any concluding remarks? Uh, uh, we're close. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a couple of questions to the, to the crowd there. And then um, also the, our next uh, items for the AI conference is a preview of our posters. And then we'll have the posters downstairs. We have only one day with posters and they're all today and uh, downstairs in the exhibit hall three. The couple of questions is uh, one is, uh, would you like another panel next year? Is it, or is it becoming redundant? We hadn't done one in a couple, two or three years. We could find another topic. Raise your hand if, if you would like another discussion like that, or don't raise your hand if you think it, oh, okay. Thank you. So, all right. <laughs> so we, we will, uh, well, okay. So we will organize another panel. If you have ideas on topics, um, we, uh, for example, if a simple model versus a complicated model, one of our esteemed member, Karen Marsban, will probably be glad to contribute to that. <laughs> um, the other one is, how many of you are within driving distance of Austin? One, so one, so one, two. So, so most of you, because uh, we were wondering why there were so many more people, if it was just because of the location or it's just the field that is growing. So I'm, I'm taking it that it's the field is growing and we, need, we just need bigger rooms. Sounds right? Yeah. All right, so thank you very much for attending our panel. Next is a preview of the posters and then the posters downstairs. Thank you all. Thank you very and much. Thank you very much, Carlos, for, uh, <laughs> for organizing and our speaker, William, Vladimir, and John. Vladimir and John. Please a round of applause. Yeah. Poster session, I think, at, uh, in the afternoon.